So welcome to chapter two. So just a fair warning, this is one of the longest chapters in the book. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into this chapter. Uh, this may be one that's a little bit more foreign to you uh, in terms of just think concepts and words that you've seen because it goes into the science of a lot of the uh, biological contaminants that we talked about. So just bear with me. This may be a chapter you have to go back and, and look at, take some notes, go back and uh, listen to again, read in the book, um, etc. So if this uh, seems a little bit odd to you, don't stress out. Um, this is kind of a unique chapter with that. But we are going to look at uh, the conditions that affect the growth of bacteria, the, the pathogens. So we talked in chapter one about viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites being those biological contaminants. And so we'll talk in more detail about those, what illnesses they cause, how can we prevent them, um, and then we'll even look at toxins. And so plant toxins, other things like that. So let's start with looking at what a microorganism is. So these are small living organisms that we can only see with a microscope. And so I can't look at my beef and see how much E. coli is on there just by looking at it. Um, and a lot of these microorganisms may not be harmful. We have a lot of bacteria in our body and in our world that are beneficial to us. But when it is a microorganism that is considered harmful and can make people sick, that is considered a pathogen. And so that's what we mean when we say the word pathogen. And then when we look at the word toxin, that's really a poison. And so some of our bacteria can produce toxins, some of our plants can produce toxins. So just some things to, to think about when we move forward. So these are the four types, and we talked about those, bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi, um, that can contribute to illness. So we'll look at those in more detail. So how do we contaminate food? So if you don't wash your hands after going to the bathroom, sneezing or vomiting on food contact surfaces, don't do that. Um, touching dirty food contact surfaces and equipment, then touching food, uh, becoming in contact with a person who is sick, all of those things can happen. And simple mistakes can cause that contamination. And so I talked a little bit in chapter one about some cross-contamination that may not be as obvious. But again, how, allowing that ready-to-eat food to touch a surface that had come in contact with raw meat. Um, storing food inappropriately, uh, not seeing signs of pests, because pests can spread disease to our food. So all of those things can cause this contamination to make people sick. So I'm betting every one of you have ha has had one of these symptoms at some point in your life, whether that's from a foodborne illness or not. And that can make foodborne illness a little bit tricky because a lot of these symptoms are very nonspecific. There are lots of things that can cause someone to, to throw up or feel nauseous. So all of those things we have to be aware of. These are some common symptoms. One I want to put out, point out that you may or may not have heard of is jaundice. And that's a yellowing of the skin and eyes. And, and jaundice could be caused by hepatitis A. That's what we're really worried about with foodborne illness. Or it could be caused by lots of other things. So just because someone has jaundice does not necessarily mean they have a foodborne illness. But it is a unique symptom that we really want to investigate to make sure that that person does not have hepatitis A. So the onset time of foodborne illness also varies. Uh, I like the 30 minutes to six weeks range. Normally it's you know 30 minutes to closer to a day, uh, but that can really vary. And, and some people normally I see will assume that when they get sick, whatever they ate last is what made them sick. So if they have you know dinner at 6 p.m. and get sick at 9 p.m., that clearly it was the dinner that made them sick. And it could be, but it also could be what they had for breakfast or what they had for lunch. So it, it's not necessarily um, just the last thing you ate because the onset time can vary based on the type of pathogen that it is. So just keep that in mind as well. So SurfSafe identifies the big six as these pathogens that are highly infectious and can cause severe illness. So these are the six that they currently identify, um, and we'll talk about these in more detail. Salmonella typhi, Shigella, non-typhoidal Salmonella, Shiga toxin producing E. coli, Hepatitis A, and norovirus. And so we'll, again, look at all those in more detail. But these are often found in a high number in an infected person's feces, so they can be, e they're easily to transfer to food, can make someone very sick from just a little bit, uh, from small doses of those pathogens. So those are some of the things that they I use to identify why these big six are the ones that they're going to focus on. So let's start by talking about bacteria a little bit more. So bacteria is really all around us. Um, there are some statistics that say that we actually have more bacteria cells in the, our human bodies than human cells, so think about that for a minute. Um, but we can't smell 
taste, see them. It's not like I can smell my chicken and know whether it has salmonella or not. And these can grow rapidly if conditions are correct, which we'll talk about. Certain bacteria can also produce toxins. And so the major thing to prevent foodborne illness from bacteria is control time and temperature. Because if we let something with some bacteria on it sit out at room temperature for a long period of time and the conditions are right for growth, then we're going to see the amount of bacteria in that food multiply. So that's the biggest thing for that. And these are the big conditions that bacteria need to grow. So we'll talk about these in more detail, but it stands for fat tom. So let's look at these. So food. So most bacteria need nutrients to survive. And so TCS food tends to support the growth of bacteria better than other foods. And so if you remember back to chapter one, and if you don't, Pause this right now and go quiz yourself and look at the TCS foods in, in chapter one. Um, but those are foods uh, such as meat, eggs, baked potatoes, um, cut melon, toma uh, cut tomato, those things that we looked at back then that really are foods that bacteria grow better in. And so that is one thing that we look at when we're deciding what bacteria need to grow. Um, acidity. So bacteria grow best in food with little to no acid. So the pH of about 7.5 to 4.6 is ideal. Um, so you can see some examples of foods with an ideal pH there. Um, you know, again, this is something for the test, just to make sure you, you know that, you know, if they asked you questions about, you know, foods that had different pHs, one was 10, one was 12, one was 2, and one was 6, um, which one would be, you know, better for bacteria to grow? The, the pH of 6, the one in that range, is going to be the best um, to ha help bacteria grow. Temperature thin, and this is the first time you're being introduced to this 41 to 135 concept, which is the temperature danger zone. You will see this several more times throughout the semester, um, and, but that's where bacteria grow best. They grow rapidly between 41 and 135, and they go even, grow even more rapidly from 70 to 125. And so that's why we, we are really worried about letting food sit out, um, especially high-risk foods, at room temperature, um, you know, outside on a hot day, because that's where bacteria growth is really going to uh, happen the most rapidly. So we want to either hold hot food above that 135 or cold food below that 41, just because that's then going to slow or lower the, the rate of bacteria growth. So time is also a factor. So bacteria need time to grow in that danger zone. So the more time it spends in the, in the danger zone, the more opportunity it has to grow to unsafe levels. So certainly leaving chicken out on the counter at room temperature for 20 minutes is very different than leaving it out for four hours in terms of bacteria growth. Oxygen, and this is the one that makes me laugh. Some need it, some don't, huh? So it's, it's kind of helpful, but it is helpful from a scientific perspective to understand how to best control each type of bacteria, understanding, um, you know, if does it need oxygen, does it not want oxygen? And so we can look at, you know, these types of bacteria may thrive more under canned foods or, or things like that. So it's not super helpful for us on a consumer level, but it is just important to, to know from a scientific standpoint. And then moisture is the last one. And so bacteria tend to grow well in foods that have a higher level of moisture, and we measure that as water activity. And so the amount of moisture available in a food, the scale goes from zero to one, one being water. So you know anything that was closer to one would ha uh, you know, have a higher rate of bacteria growth theoretically than you know, a food that was lower on the water scale. So we really can't control all of those. You know, I can't have like a less moist uh, tomato or something like that. But what we can do is control time and temperature. So we can keep food out of the danger zone and limit how much time it spends in the danger zone. So again, that's the controlling time and temperature. And this just shows stages of growth. I don't, I'm not too worried about you, you understanding this in detail, but you can look at this more in your book. And that's just, you know, the number of bacteria versus time. And so we can see once you hit that log phase, bacteria growth grows exponentially. And so the longer we leave food out in that danger zone, the more bacteria we're going to have in that phase. And so this just also shows that at temperature. And so you can see that at 95 degrees, that bacteria is growing way more rapidly. And we don't see big spikes in bacteria growth at the 50 or below temperatures until day two or later. So one 
last thing about bacteria that's unique is that they can change into spores. And so spores can be found in dirt and can survive cooking temperatures and then can change back to a form that grows. And this is one thing we worry about with things like botulism as well. Um, so that's just something to, to think about with bacteria that we have to be careful. And that's sometimes why we have to be extra careful with our foods that um, grow in the dirt. Or especially, especially things like roots, like onions, we have to be careful with and things, just making sure we're, you know, not getting a lot of that dirt on our cutting board, etc. So these are the major foodborne bacteria, and we'll go through these in more detail. So don't get overwhelmed. There are a lot. Um, it's tough. This is the most detailed chapter for that reason. Um, again, the big six are probably the most important to look at, but we'll go through all of these. These are the ones that they really identify controlling time and temperature is the most important thing from causing the bac these bacteria to cause a foodborne illness. So let's start with those. So Bacillus cereus, um, there's a diarrhea one and a vomiting one. Um, and these are from cooked vegetables, meat, milk. Um, again, this one causes more of the diarrhea, whereas the vomiting illness from rice dishes, um, and this can cause the nausea and vomiting on that. And so this bacteria, we can see, you know, in several different foods, but rice is one of those, especially, rice takes a long time to cook, um, and so a lot of, most restaurants aren't cooking rice to order, they have rice already cooked, and so that's something that you, if it's not stored or held at the correct temperature, it can be high risk as well, so just something to think about. Um, so again, controlling time and temperature is the most important prevention method for this, and then there are others, you know, and that's what I want you to think about when when SurfSafe sometimes says most important, that doesn't mean other things aren't important. <clears throat> that doesn't mean it's not important to, um, you know, do the other aspects of it. Wash your hands, good personal hygiene, but this is really the most important prevention method. Listeria is another one we've seen a lot in the news. Um, the, we, we used to, these are still really important, so ready to eat foods like deli meat, hot dogs, soft cheese, unpasteurized dairy. Um, you're starting to see Listeria a little bit more in our food supply. Um, in processed foods, even like, like there was an outbreak in ice cream, um, even some fruits like uh, melon had some listeria for a while, like cut melon. And so just things to, to think about. Um, we are most concerned with listeria in pregnant women and newborns, so it can cause miscarriage in a pregnant woman. So this is why a lot of times they may recommend being really careful with foods that may have listeria to that group. And again, control time and temperature is the most important prevention method, but all of those things listed on there are also important to prevent listeria. All right, E. coli. Um, and don't feel like you need to memorize all those numbers, etc. Um, I don't think they'll try to confuse you with different kinds of E. coli. Um, but this specific one, they're talking about a toxin producing E. coli, and the most common one you may have heard of is the 0157H7. Um, that's one that, you know, if you watch like Food Inc., um, which I realize is old now, but that had um, talked about an outbreak from that specific strain of E. coli and ground beef. Uh, but, you know, this can be a very serious disease, and so we want to be really careful with that. It can cause kidney failure. Um, so gr ground beef and contaminated produce are the biggest places we see E. coli. And so, again, controlling time and temperature is most important to prevent that growth further, um, but cooking food to, and especially ground beef to minimum temperatures, trying to prevent cross-contamination, all of those things are definitely important as well. Our Campylobacter dejuni um, is commonly found in poultry and you know, several other sources as well. Um, you can see it has a wide variety of symptoms with that. Uh, and controlling time and temperature is the most important thing for this, uh, but especially cooking poultry to the required minimum temperature. You know, we don't normally see uh, rare poultry being served. We shouldn't. Um, so making sure we're cooking poultry, especially to the correct temperature, is really important. Clostridium perfidens. Um, this is one that is commonly found in meat and poultry or dishes made with that. Um, and so you can see some of the symptoms for that. Um, and again, controlling time and temperature is the most important thing for this specific strain as well. And then Clostridium botulinum, or which is the one that causes botulism, uh, we see this mostly in incorrectly canned food or reduced oxygen packaging food, so vacuum sealed things. This is what they worry more about with 
sous vide. Um, temperature abuse things like baked potatoes and then untreated garlic oil mixtures. We're really worried about botulism in a lot of these cases. Um, botulism can cause nausea and vomiting, but later it can cause weakness, difficulty speaking, and botulism can be fatal as well. So just things that we want to pay attention to. Controlling time and temperature is really important. Um, again, making sure that we're can if, if we're home canning that you're following a recipe because I know this maybe sounds silly, but every different type of vegetable um, and fruit and things um, have different needs in terms of length of time that they may need or pressure that needs to be used, etc. when you're looking at canning. All right, so these two, cross-contamination is the biggest thing we have to worry about. So non-typhoidal salmonella. Um, so this is the salmonella that we think of in Normally, people think about it in poultry and eggs. This is the, you know, don't eat raw cookie dough kind of one. Um, but it can be in produce and dairy products as well. And you can see some of the symptoms that that can cause. And again, cross-contamination is the most important one. But cooking it um, to minimum internal temperature is very important as well. And then salmonella typhi is just a different variety of this. So this is the one that causes typhoid fever. Um, and this can be in ready-to-eat food and beverages. Um, so it can be passed from person to person on that. So high fever is a symptom, and you can see some of the others as well. And again, preventing cross-contamination and excluding food handlers who have this is really important for prevention as well. All right, these two are majorly focused on um, good personal hygiene, so washing hands, etc. So we have Shigella. Um, which Shigella we see a lot in things that can be easily contaminated by hand. So they'll talk about like potato salad, tuna salad, um, or if one, sometimes we'll see this if produce is washed with contaminated water. So have to be careful what we're, how we're washing and cleaning our, our produce. And sometimes this is why they're careful about like rinsing off certain things in the sink and then you're contaminating your, your other produce and you're washing that in that sink. So you have to be careful with those. Um, so you can see symptoms on that. So good personal hygiene is most important. But then also excluding food handlers who have been diagnosed with that. And controlling flies, that can be one that can spread Shigella as well. Staphylococcus aureus. Um, this is one that is can be from person to person as well. So if someone's handling it during prepping and they have it and they can pass that on as well. So you have to be careful with those. Good personal hygiene, most important thing for Staph aureus. Um, making sure we're washing our hands well, cover wounds on hands and arms. You may have heard of this before in other um, avenues, even things like, uh, I, I've seen this spread in like high school sports programs or something like uh, wrestling is a common one or other things where there may be people coming in contact with mats and things like that. So it's the same bacteria. So we just have to be careful with, with that kind of thing. And then these bacteria are the two that we really want to look at purchasing from approved reputable suppliers. And a lot, that's something that's very important with seafood. And you'll see both of these are often found in oysters. So um, both of our Vibrios and oysters from contaminated water. And so some of these are seafood that's caught from contaminated water. Um, we may not know it by looking at it. And so that's why making sure you have good suppliers who aren't catching things from contaminated water because then it can produce some of these symptoms as well. So, approved vector suppliers and potentially cooking to minimum internal temperatures. But we know often things like oysters are served raw, and so we need to make sure we're having really good suppliers for that. All right, so whirlwind of bacteria. So again, I don't expect you to have all of that memorized and not completely understood right now, but hopefully that's helpful for you to look at it. Um, Viruses, a couple things to look at, um, carried by humans and animals, they require living hosts to grow. So they're, they're different than bacteria in that way. So they're not growing in food if they're just sitting out. Um, but they can be transferred through food and remain infectious in food. So, you know, it's not necessarily the same extreme worry about time and temperature, but there are lots of other things that we're looking at. And a lot of times we talk about this through the fecal oral routes of viral contamination. So they can be transferred person to person, first people to food, or even person to a food contact surface, and then that surface then transfers it to food. Um, we do carry a viruses and feces, and if someone's not washing their hands properly after going to the bathroom, it can be a big source of it as well. So 
One big thing to know too is that viruses aren't destroyed by normal cooking temperatures. And so that's something to think about. Um, you know, it's not just like we can leave our food, it doesn't matter if it's bacteria or virus if we cook it well, because um, it won't kill everything. And the same thing goes for those toxins that we talked about before. So exclude food handlers who are vomiting and have diarrhea or jaundice. Make sure you're washing their hands correctly. And then avoiding that bare hand contact with ready to eat food. And that's something that they'll talk about. Um, Surf safe will say those words. So the bare hand contact. So again, that would be, you know, I just got a roll and handed it to you with my bare hands. So that's a ready to eat food. I shouldn't be use, I should either be using a glove, tongs, something like that to to you know handle that food that is ready to eat. So these are our two major foodborne illness viruses. So hepatitis A and norovirus. And hepatitis A, first of all, hepatitis is related to the liver. So you can see that jaundice can be a symptom of that. Um, and we can see hepatitis A in ready to eat food or shellfish from contaminated water. And you can see some of the symptoms there. Um, again, good personal hygiene, excluding food handlers who have hepatitis A or who've had jaundice for seven days or less, making sure we're washing our hands, shellfish from approved suppliers, all those things are important for hepatitis A prevention. And then norovirus is one you may have heard of. This is one I, I think of a lot with cruise ships or, or schools or prisons or um, places where individuals are eating uh, in kind of confined areas with each other. So ready to eat food, um, shellfish can also have that. But we do see those in those um, kind of large feeding operations as well. Uh, and so norovirus can cause severe vomiting, diarrhea, etc. Good personal hygiene is the most important thing to prevent norovirus spread, um, making sure we're excluding food handlers who are vomiting or have um, been diagnosed with norovirus, making sure washing hands, all of that. So you see a lot of these prevention methods are the same for each one. It, um, they're not necessarily new and novel each time, but it's important to do them for a variety of reasons. So we don't have as much detail to talk about with parasites, but it is something that we do occasionally see, and so we have to be careful. And we do see them. We don't see them as much in the U.S., but it is something that is, is definitely seen worldwide. So require a host to live and reproduce in here. Um, seafood, wild game, um, if you have produce washed with contaminated water, all of those things can have parasites. So the biggest prevention is purchasing food from approved reputable suppliers, making sure certain things we're cooking to minimum temperatures, that especially foods that are higher risk, like some of our game, etc. And then this is also why fish that will be serving raw, served raw or undercooked must be frozen correctly. And this is something that you may not have realized happens. But sushi, um, you know, ahi tuna that may just be served seared or raw, um, those fishes, those fish are, excuse me, are um, frozen often kind of like flash frozen right after they're caught. So it's not necessarily like we're taking fish that's been in the freezer and trying to turn that into um, sushi. That wouldn't work well. The texture would be off, etc. But they have methods that they can freeze it in a way after it's caught to um, kill off parasites and prevent that spread of parasites as well. These are some of the major foodborne parasites, and the biggest thing for these is approved reputable suppliers. All right, so our anisocyst, um, you can often see in raw and undercooked fish, and so you can see some examples of those there, um, and we can see worms in that, so parasites are not pleasant to think about. Uh, but again, making sure we're cooking those and getting those from approved reputable suppliers is important. Um, Cryptosporidium, again, contaminated water is a big source of this, and so again, then, if that contaminated water is used to uh, wash produce, we can see that as well. So again, purchase from approved reputable suppliers, making sure water is treated correctly, and then if anyone has diarrhea, making sure they're out of that. And the same thing goes for processing plants for fruits and vegetables for that. Um, a lot of those things, it's not just restaurants we're worried about. Giardia is one that's oft also seen in incorrectly treated water. There are several um, lakes and other kind of bodies of water that had some giardia a few years ago. And so again, that can cause some severe illness as well. So approved up suppliers, treated water, same things as before. And the cyclospora, um, again, same thing. We often see it in produce like berries and lettuce. Um, but it is very similar to the things we talked about um, in the last several parasites as well. Uh, fungi is our last category. Sometimes we make them sick, sometimes we eat them, right? You have blue cheese, there are mushrooms, things like that. Um, they can spoil food. 
So mold and yeast are, are two examples of that. Um, so basic characteristics, um, they may produce toxins. Uh, they can grow well in most conditions. Uh, they do well in acidic food with low water. Um, they're slowed by free freezer cooler temperatures, not necessarily completely destroyed. And we do have to be careful um, with mold. Uh, there are certain molds that we can't just cut off. So, you know, sometimes people will see bread with some mold and they'll just cut that part off. But that mold, and a lot of times, can actually, like, create spores. And even if you don't visibly see it in other parts of the food, it can be in part of that food. And so we have to be really careful with that. Yeast can also spoil food quickly. Um, you can, this is a jam picture because oftentimes we'll see it in jam. Um, may look like a white pink discoloration. Um, may kind of produce that um, alcohol smell or taste, like fermentation kind of smell on there. So don't, not eating those foods as well. The last big category for this chapter is toxins. And so we'll have them in seafood, plants, mushrooms, um, Seafood toxins can't be smelled or tasted, so again, with a lot of them, we have to be careful. We also can't destroy them by freezing or cooking, and so that's a big thing about toxins we have to be careful about. So we can see some naturally occurring in fish or from pathogens or fish that eat a lot of smaller fish. That toxin may build up. Um, and then shellfish may eat algae that's toxic, so if it's in toxic water, we have to be careful with. So approved reputable suppliers is the biggest thing for preventing these seafood toxins as well. So histamine is one that you can see in like tuna, bonita, um, mahi-mahi mackerel, some of our bigger fish on that. Um, and this is one that can cause like tingling sensations, reddening of the face and neck, etc. And so approved reputable suppliers is the biggest thing, but also time and temperature abuse during storage and prep is really important. And so that's one thing that you'll look at with a Proof suppliers for seafood is making sure that they are controlling temperature during delivery, etc. Um, cigatoxin or uh, cigaroptoxin poisoning. Uh, these are those predatory fish like barracuda, grouper, snapper. Um, this is a unique one that has reversal of hot and cold sensations. So nausea, vomiting, tingling, those kind of things. And again, um, making sure any they come from any approved reputable suppliers as well. Um, saxitoxin is commonly found in shellfish from colder water, so you can see some of those up there. Um, some of the same symptoms, numbness, tingling, dizziness as well, um, so it can be pretty severe with the paralytic shellfish poisoning. So again, approved reputable suppliers. Um, brevitoxin has that neurotoxic shellfish poisoning. These are more in warmer water shellfish. So similar shellfish is warmer water. Again, some similar symptoms can also have that reversal of hot and cold sensations. So approved reptile suppliers is important for that again. Um, the demoic acid as well, the amnesic shellfish poisoning. This is all those Pacific Northwest. So a little bit different as the other ones. Um, and you can see some similar symptoms. And this can be very serious as well. So approved reptile suppliers is very important. Um, so again, with all those shellfish, approved reptile suppliers is very important to prevent those. Um, mushroom toxins is another one, and so things caused by eating toxic wild mushrooms. And really the biggest thing with mushrooms is that approved suppliers, uh, a lot of times we have amateur mushroom hunters who don't know the difference because sometimes we have uh, mushrooms that look very similar. And so like even in, in Missouri, there's, a, there's the morel mushrooms that everyone goes after, and there's also a false morel that looks very similar. Um, but it's toxic, and so we need to ensure that those are coming from approved, reputable suppliers. Um, and then lastly, just some other plants can have toxins. You could, there are some wild plants that are toxic that we could pick. Um, it, like undercooked kidney beans can have toxin. Uh, so there's lots of things that we have to be careful with. Uh, wild turnips, you know, all those kind of things. So making sure we're uh, preventing those things by purchasing plants from approved, reputable suppliers, all of that are important things to think of. So I know I just threw a lot at you. Um, review this. It's ready for you to, to watch as much as you need. Make sure you look at this in the book. And really focus on the highlights. You're not expected to memorize everything from this chapter. Um, but do your best to understand the highlights of the different pathogens. And what are the prevention methods, what causes it, etc.